Welcome everybody, thank you for joining us here on the Infinite Prosperity Podcast. My name is Louisa Havers and I help high achievers, entrepreneurs and coaches lift the lid on life and business so that they can live at their highest value. Each episode we will bring you our favourite founders, CEOs and guest experts to share with you their insights and strategies to expand your wealth consciousness, your spiritual leadership and aligned business strategies. We know that living in alignment with your soul's mission is what fulfills you and we are here to show you how to achieve this in an energetically aligned way. If you haven't already, be sure to claim your free abundance activation in the Akashic Records. Go to louisahavers.com forward slash gift to unlock your abundance activation today. And if you'd like my support in having aligned success in life and business, then contact me at www.louisahavers.com and let's explore together if it's an aligned match. Get ready to live at your highest value and to expand into your next level of money as you elevate and receive more. You create more for others. Righty ho, let's dive into today's episode. Welcome everybody, welcome to our episode this week. I am so excited. We're going to be talking about all the things around beliefs and how we can show up for ourselves. And I have a very, very special guest with me today. I have Carmony Wood. So a huge welcome, Carmony. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here with you. I'm so excited to have this conversation with you. And I'd love to share your bio so people can, you know, get to, get to know you. And then we'll dive into all the, dive into all the things. So mm-hmm. Carmony is a certified life coach, helps high achievers heal their relationships with themselves. And she helps people take courageous steps in identifying limiting beliefs, reasons for stagnation and overcoming self-doubt in order to live a fulfilling professional and personal life oh fantastic she is the creator of authentic me and ceo of live joy your way a coaching company that helps high performers and overachievers who have seen success through old rooted traditional metrics re-establish their relational self-awareness oh fantastic Carmony is trained in internal family systems, cognitive behavioral based coaching, and she can help her clients navigate past traumas and toxic relationships and truly live in self-acceptance, self-confidence and self-leadership. Carmony is a best-selling author, holding certifications in various modalities, including life, wellness, high performance coaching, teen life, conscious uncoupling, calling in the one, new money Mm -hmm. story, breathwork, meditation, and diversity, equity, inclusion, so important, and belonging. And she is also trained in conscious parenting and coaching for children. Oh, this is so exciting. Uh, Congratulations on all of that and a huge welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you. And you said that so beautifully. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, it was a joy to joy to read. And I'm so excited to to dive into this this conversation to, today. So I always love to ask people, you know, how did you get to do what you're doing now? You know, what what was the the path? Because there's always, you know, there's always a story. There's yes. always a story. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> um, and I, I will say that it was not a linear path in terms of how I got to this specific position. So when I first started working in the business world, I was part of the dot-com industry and I was working as a project manager and quickly found myself running the project management office. So that meant that I was basically in charge of all the things, including the people and not just the the timing of the projects, but it was resources and all the elements that went into delivering for the dot-com. What I found in that role was I just really loved working with the people and trying to figure out what it was that they needed and how I could help them figure out what was keeping them from working and moving forward in in terms of getting their deliverables done. Um, Of course, the dot-com world, as we knew it back in the early 2000s, blew up. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and I found myself uh, running a law practice. Um, and, and in that role, once again, was wearing many different hats. But the one that I kept continually finding myself in was talking to clients about what it was that they really wanted and what would success mean if they, this if the litigation went through. Also working with the, the uh, employees, you know, oh, you're a legal assistant. What would it be that you'd want to work through professionally? So all of all this to say, from a professional standpoint, I kept finding myself in this role of supporting people, understanding them, helping them figure out how to move themselves forward. At the same time, personally, I was going through my own transformation because I'm also the mother of five. And my children, I will say, are my greatest teachers. They're also the best mm-hmm. mirrors that we ever have. <laughs> and I was watching my children, especially my middle child at the time, uh, release 
really um, finding herself people pleasing and worrying about other people's needs and desires so much so that it was starting to be detrimental to her and her own emotional health. And I could see that. And I recognize that that was coming from me in the sense of she was emulating and watching how I would show up because the truth was that for years I had been a people pleaser for years. I'm a high achiever myself, but also perfectionism, but really putting everybody else in front of me and not really paying attention to my own needs. So I recognized from a personal standpoint that that was my invitation to do some self-growth. Because if I didn't, I was going to continue to show up that way for my children. And I was going to basically set up that to just repeat itself. And I didn't want that for my children if they could. I mean, yes, obviously empathy. We want to teach that. We want to teach caring for others. But there's a line between overgiving and overfunctioning, which is where I was, and, and, and caring for people. So I did do that work and realized that that was part of my experience and what I was meant to do because through that personal experience, I could then say and recognize that from a professional standpoint, what I was called to do is work with individuals one-on-one and realize that that was really my calling. How can I bring these two things together? And so that's when I went through professional training on life coaching on different modalities, because we all have different ways of assimilating information. So you know, that really started my journey. So about six years ago, I opened my practice and have been working one-to-one since. Oh, that's <laughs> incredible. And congratulations for being in business for, for six years as well. That's fantastic. Thank you. Uh, Thank I share you. that as well. So I was like, oh, we're twinning in six years in, in business. So <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. And um, what an incredible journey. And I love what you're saying about, you know, our children are our greatest teachers and, and, and mirrors because that really resonated for me as well. And as I, um, my, our children, my children, my children, my, my sons who are men now, <laughs> they're 25 and, and 22 and my eldest edits our podcast. So that's why I was, <laughs> as I was saying my children, I was like, he's going to be like, mom, <laughs> I'm a man. Um, But I remember him actually saying to me, you know, I can see the difference in you since you've done all this inner work. And it's just Mm. incredible, isn't it? They are watching like sponges um, as to how we're showing up and it just has a huge, huge impact on them beyond what we can really ever fathom, I think. Oh, absolutely. Um, My oldest is 22 now. And she routinely says to me that had I not done that inner work, she doesn't know that she would be able to see certain things in herself. And, and she, I mean, she's a, she's a professional ballerina. Talk about a very uh, cutthroat industry. (laughs) That self-talk is so important. And so by her witnessing part of my growth, but also the normalization Mm -hmm. that it's okay to do this work, it's, it's actually a strength to go in and say what's really happening for me um, has allowed her permission in some sense to do that for herself so that when things do get really stressful and the inner critic is really loud for her particularly, she can step outside of it into observer and recognize, you know, oh, that's, that's an old narrative, for instance. That's a narrative from when I was, you know, 10 or 12 in ballet class and had a certain teacher who, t- who said certain things. Um, which allows that room to to change mm. up and reframe. It's so, so powerful. You know, I often think now, like, it's incredible how our consciousness is growing and evolving because we've got all these tools available to us and how the coaching industry has developed. When you think back into, I think about my parents' generation where this just wasn't available. <laughs> you know, uh, people would yeah. go to psychiatrists and so all, all bottle things up and think that mm-hmm. their thoughts were who they were. And yes. not have this awareness that, you know, we talk about in the personal development world around limiting beliefs and, you know, and I know that that term is really banded around. So I think it would be something that'd be really useful for our listeners to, to, to hear your take on that. You know, what do we mean by, by limiting beliefs? Mm, I love that question because I do think that we, we hear it bounced around so often that it's taken on a different sort of meaning or, or way that people see it for me personally. I try to use the term false beliefs, which is uh, a a way that we believe or what we believe about ourselves based on either someone else's narrative or a false narrative that was that was assimilated through experiences or messages that we received. 
So what do I mean by that? An example for me personally, growing up in a very predominantly white town in Connecticut, clearly not not white, <laughs> have a very odd name considered uh, compared to everybody else. There was experiences that I had as a five or six year old with my peers that I then internalized and created a narrative of I don't belong or I'm I'm different or I have to prove my worthiness. And that became that false belief and false narrative then led into the limiting beliefs of you're not enough or unworthy unless you please others, right? So it transmuted along the way, Mm. but that's what I refer to when I say limiting beliefs. I actually say it's really about the false beliefs that we have about ourselves. A lot of times they, they sound like I'm not enough. I'm unworthy. I don't belong. I'm unlovable. Um, Those are the main ones. I'm undeserving is another one. Uh, And so then they lean into things like imposter syndrome. You know, that's a new term too, that's kind of popped up. Well, it's imposter syndrome. What do we mean by that? It means the inner critic is telling us that, again, a false belief about ourselves. And if we can understand that narrative and where it came from, it's not about sitting in, in that narrative. It's about becoming aware of it. So then we can make those conscious choices of what's actually true about us and how, what committed actions do we want to take to move through it and into what, what is our truth today? Mm. oh it's so good so good I think it's because we are like you said all on a journey and so much that can kind of <laughs> get morphed and twisted <laughs> along the way in terms of our right. our beliefs and what our subconscious is up to in, and in its role in trying to keep us safe ultimately um as we're oh, na- yeah. navigating our way through through life and um I I certainly see this with 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 clients when um they come to me we can be really hard on ourselves around these beliefs and um I'm sure you see this too and it's something that um you know we talk about a lot is around you know how can we have more compassion compassion for ourselves this is something that you see as well in terms of you know how does how does self-compassion help us from your perspective yeah, you know, we have, it, it seems so much easier to be compassionate for others, but this idea of self-compassion has eluded us for so long. Yeah. Um, I truly believe that, and, and I love Chris Germer and Kristen Neff's work on this because it is so powerful, but it really, if we're going to summarize and boil it down to, it is kindness over judgment. It is common humanity that we're all going through this, this thing called life, this challenge called life. And that other people have had similar experiences to what we've had. We're not isolated and we can talk about it. We can talk about what's happening for us and get that support. And then of course, being in the present moment, right? Because so often we are ruminating over the past or we're future, we're future tripping, meaning Mm. we're worrying about what's going to happen and, you know, trying to control the uncertain and what might evolve. And instead it's coming back to this present moment. What, what is here in front of me right here and right now? And when we're able to practice that, we're able to say kindness over judgment. How how can I learn from this experience instead of put myself down from it? How can I learn to be vulnerable with my support system, the people that I trust? How can I talk about my challenges and learn from others? And then how can I stay in this present moment? That's how we start breaking down these false beliefs. Because what we're doing through that self-compassion is we're, we're coming back home to self and we're coming back home to what's actually true. Yes, being able to find who we truly are beneath all the all the layers of layers of programming that that we have. Yeah, we. You, I'm sure you talk about this with your with your clients and go into to great depth. And I'd love to to hear your reflections on this. Uh, this is a conversation that comes up in my community quite a lot. With well, the question people will ask is like, "Why am I self sabotaging?" And yeah, yeah. <laughs> so th- this is a big one for people. So I'd love to let's unpack this one here. Mm-hmm. It's a huge one. You know, it, it's, it comes up in relationships. It comes up in, in professional uh, careers as well. Um, my take on self-sabotage, it's a form of protection. It's the part of us that is either fearful of failure or fearful of the unknown. And so by self-sabotaging, there is a way that we get to control the fallout. Meaning that part says, oh, well, I'm, we don't want you to have, um, have this, like, let's take relationships, for example, we don't want this relationship to fall apart and then you're hurt. So subconsciously that part's protecting its intention is to protect. So it does something to mess up the relationship because then guess what? You know, it's coming you, you're kind of the, the owner of that. So you can control the fallout and the hurt that comes with it because you saw it coming. It's like bracing for a car accident. 
Mm. We self-sabotage as a protection mechanism. And really, if we can just get curious with that part and just love that part and say, wow, you know, that part of me is really trying to protect me. Yet what that part's also doing is keeping me from what's possible. That part is keeping me from the possibility that maybe this relationship works out. That part is keeping me from potentially work going up the corporate ladder, getting that promotion. Mm -hmm. That part's keeping me from potentially having my business expand because ultimately it's trying to protect me from failure, but instead it's keeping me from even the possibility of of having success. Mm. Once we get curious with that part, we can say, well, I recognize and I see you. And also I don't need you to do that because I'm going to be okay. I can find my way through this because that's where we build self-trust. We build, we use self-compassion. We use that inner dialogue. We pay attention to how we're talking to ourselves, and we can break it down that way. So ultimately what what it's about is recognizing that self-sabotage really is a protection mechanism. Mm -hmm. And also it's protecting us from the ability to maybe move forward. And it's actually, so it's not protecting, it's actually holding us back. Yes, it's kind of got a, a dual outcome <laughs> one with uh i'm gonna keep you safe you're like actually know you're being a pain <laughs> because i want to move exactly forward. you can feel exactly. like this argument going on in your head like what am i doing <laughs> um, and it's how we choose to look at it right and so mm-hmm. if we're looking at it as like oh this is keeping me safe then yeah you might stay in your comfort zone and you're not going to end up stepping out into that growth zone where there's more possibility for you yes yes and i, and I love what you're saying there around actually this is a a mechanism to keep yourself safe so we don't need to be in that space of judging ourselves for it it's just really recognizing that um actually it's kicking up because you have stepped forward i always say uh you know talk about the monkey mind and um use that analogy where you know the monkey mind's very quiet when we're just kind of doing the same same (laughs) but the the moment we're actually moving forward it starts to get really noisy (laughs) Yes. I love that. I love that. That's so true. That is so true. (laughs) That's when the chatter starts. Exactly. (laughs) And you're like, oh, it's got really noisy in my head. (laughs) What's going on? You you touched on, um, you know, personal relationships and and this, this is something that, you know, of course we're all in relationships all the time. How else do you see this showing up for people in personal relationships? Because I think this is such a big one for, for people. I see, are you referring to self-sabotage specifically? Yes, yes. Yeah. I see self-sabotage in, it, it happens in romantic relationships. It happens in workplace relationships. It happens in friendships. And it does, it, it shows up when we feel vulnerable or we feel we might be exposed. And that's generally when the self-sabotage will pop up because again, it's trying to protect from potentially getting hurt. But what ends up happening is you you hurt yourself <laughs> again to control the fallout. Yeah. Um, so a lot of times we'll see it in romantic relationships where I'll have a client say to me, you know, I don't know why I just, you know, everything seemed to be fine. And then all of a sudden the relationship just imploded. And if you really break it down, it's like, well, yes. And your part was that you cheated on that person. If everything was fine, let's break that down. And really it was not a conscious like, oh, I'm going to go self-sabotage, but it was the part of of that person that was activated that said, well, I'm afraid this is going to fall apart and I'm afraid of getting hurt. So it takes control of the situation says, I'm going to take these actions. Now I know it's about to fall apart. I can, it's going to hurt, but I know it's coming. Mm -hmm. Again, the analogy to the car accident, you see it coming so you can brace. Uh, It still hurts. We still get hurt. Mm -hmm. So true. So true. And that piece that I often will see with people as well, it's almost like people can brace for something, they're anticipating things, something going wrong before it's gone wrong. And so they don't really allow yourself to enjoy something because, you know, and that's a self-sabotage, you know, as well from that perspective yeah. of um, yeah. you know, really not allowing yourself to, let's just go, go with the flow and enjoy it and, and to be able to allow ourselves to experience a new level of happiness or a new level of joy or a new level of love in a relationship um mm-hmm. and because it starts to feel unfamiliar <laughs> our subconscious is yeah. is bringing in that that bracing bracing mode yeah yeah and you know the thing with unfamiliar is um and that's why i think people repeat toxic dynamics like they they might have multiple relationships that are toxic and it's because it's familiar to the subconscious and so the, it's not that it's healthy. They're not actually wanting to be in that, but it's a familial, a familiar thing. So therefore they just stay in it. 
Uh, this happens a lot too. If somebody was like, let's, you know, somebody was brought up by toxic parents and then they find themselves in a toxic relationship. Oftentimes we can trace it back to, it wasn't, they were looking for that, but it was just familiar. That dynamic was familiar. So they stayed in it. And so really, I mean, you could almost call that self-sabotage too, where it's like, well, I'm self-sabotaging by staying in the familiar instead of allowing myself to step into maybe what is new and what is uncertain to see if there's a possibility there. Being in, being able to be open to the possibility, yeah. I think that's that's. Yeah. I love what you're saying there. It really feels like allowing yourself to kind of step into that e- e- expansion. You you mm-hmm. mentioned earlier just to come back about the imposter syndrome piece, and you know something I'm always talking about is you know moving through, um, moving out of contraction and into expansion, and moving beyond stagnation and into e- expansion and you know, that piece where we're actually allowing ourselves to grow. So I'd love your thoughts on, you know, how does imposter syndrome and how does self-doubt contribute to to stagnation? I think that would be so helpful for, for everyone. Oh, yeah. So it's, um, I actually just had a conversation with a client about this last night where um, the self-doubt and the the imposter syndrome, the, oh, this is a fluke, or I really don't know what I'm doing. I'm just faking it. Uh, leads to the paralysis of making a decision and moving forward. And really what that is, is it's the, well, I'm I'm afraid of making a mistake or I'm afraid of failing. But ultimately what we're really needing to recognize is it's the inner critic that's running the show, right? The inner Mm -hmm. critic that says you're not going to be okay if you make a mistake. And it's like, and, and it's about recognizing that that's just, again, a false narrative that you're, you're going to be okay because you've made it through all of life's challenges thus far. And we know that because empirical <laughs> empirical evidence of you sitting right here right now <laughs> is that you've made it through those challenges, right? So we can actually break down that belief that I'm not going to be okay by simply saying, well, of course I am because I've done it before. Mm. So it's, it's okay to, to maybe not know the answer. It's okay to have doubt. I mean, of course we're human, we're going to have doubt, but then it's also recognizing that with doubt, we can also hold space for, and I can figure it out and I can find a solution, and I can talk to others for support, and I, and I, right? There's all these other options. So what we're learning to do is hold space and expand ourselves out to say, I can notice the self-doubt, and I can put all of my energy into this whole other space over here that says, I can trust myself to take whatever steps I need to, to continue putting one foot in front of the other and moving forward. Mm. I love what you said there about the and I it what I was really hearing was this this sort of switch from often we will we will castrate ourselves by saying but I can't do x y and z whereas what you're saying is the the and is the expansive mm-hmm. piece yes yes exactly the but is when we say but it, it is it's an ending it's a period the and is really more that comma right so we're putting a comma and this and this right we continue to move forward i love that and actually bringing being able to bring that into our language if we're hearing ourselves saying but is to think actually what if i flip it and just say and what am i going to allow myself to say afterwards yes exactly exactly uh, it's fun. It's funny you say that because I that was one of the things that I would routinely challenge myself to do as I was moving into going into my growth zone. It was a couple things. One, um, to catch myself when I apologized. <laughs> as a people pleaser, we apologize all the time. So that was a game I played myself. How many times did I apologize today? Uh, and then also switch from a but into an and and just see what opens up. Mm-hmm. Those were two very, very important things that I learned during my own growth process. Yeah. And I, you know, you've touched on something there, which I just think is really, uh, really key. And I know this will resonate with everyone that's listening is that piece around actually very consciously taking control of what, what is going on in your head in terms of the, you know, the catching those programs that are running. We do have to be very um, conscious. Otherwise the the subconscious is just going to go off and do its own thing. <laughs> it runs on autopilot unless we're willing to say, no, I have, I have ownership of it. And also it allows for diffusion to happen because when it's on autopilot, it really is. We are the thought instead of mm-hmm. it saying that's just a thought. And we're going to have thousands of thoughts a day. So can I just have that thought and continue to put my energy into these other thoughts that are more meaningful for me, more values-based for me, and then take action with those 
instead of continuing to just identify with this thought that doesn't mm-hmm. serve me. So good. It is. It's that piece, isn't it, of actually don't believe your thoughts that just randomly float across your brain as your nervous system is is deciding that it does or doesn't like something. Um, yeah. How often have we listened to our thoughts and suddenly then decided to believe it? And then we're just off on a completely different path because we've listened to it. <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. It's like the whole adage of what, um, you know, don't read everything on the internet. Yeah. Don't believe every thought that runs through your head either. (laughs) (laughs) So true. (laughs) So true. That is, that's a really, that's a really important one. Cause of course everybody consciously knows that we would not believe everything on the internet. We know it's like a, you know, a sort of, um, a minefield out there. Um, yet we just can if we're not in that if we're not self-aware and I know everybody who's listening to this is self-aware but it just kind of you know if I reflect back to the the unself-aware Louisa that there was a version of her <laughs> earlier on in my in my uh, lifetime that um, you know did believe everything that was running through her head and, you know, and until I you know went off and did my psychology degree and, and all the things and it was like Oh, hang on a second. I can actually, Mm -hmm. what a gift. I can take control of this. Thank God. (laughs) You know? (laughs) Yes. Yes. More people to know this because I think it's very, very freeing uh, when you suddenly realize that you can actually take control. You don't have to believe the noise in your head. Um, Mm -hmm. And, and how many relationships will improve? Businesses will improve. It it goes on, doesn't it? It goes on. It's it, it, to use your word, it's expansive right? Mm. It just, it, it allows for that expansion to happen. Yes, I think there's just so much value here. Thank you so much. I'd love to, you know, just to kind of pull it all together. What would you, what would you say would be three tips for entrepreneurs who are looking to have, you know, more prosperity, more success, more love, more, all, more fulfillment in life? What would be your three tips? Well, as an entrepreneur myself, I would say self-compassion is the number one thing. It's it's kindness over judgment. If anything, any takeaway, see as an entrepreneur, if you can just practice more kindness to yourself, you know, if you're, if, what would you say to your best friend? What would you say to a loved one? Say that same thing to yourself. Um, Being forgiving. Self-forgiveness is huge. We're going to make mistakes as an entrepreneur and it's, we are not defined by our mistakes. Instead, it's, what did you, what did you, what did you learn and how can you grow and how can you continue to move forward? And then honestly, it is about, especially as an entrepreneur, it is about mindfulness. It is about this present moment, the right here, right now. Yes, we set goals for the future and it's totally, I mean, absolutely, we're going to do that. That's what we need to do as entrepreneurs, but it's also allow that goal to be without us future tripping over it. And also don't ruminate over this past, be in the present moment, enjoy what's happening in front of you. Because so often as an entrepreneur, I think we're constantly looking towards the future that we forget to actually live life now. And that's so important. There's no, there's no time like the present moment. That's mm-hmm. so beautiful. Ah, such wisdom, wisdom here. Thank you so much, Kamani. Thank you for our conversation today. I've just absolutely, absolutely loved it. How can people get hold of you? Where, where do they find you? Tell us all the things. And I know that you've got an incredible free gift as well. Do tell, tell everybody. Um, all yes. The crazy things. Yes. <laughs> so they can find me on the internet at kamaniwood.com. Um, and then of course I'm on Facebook and Instagram with the handle it's authentic me. And of course the free gift is an ebook on limiting beliefs. So if you would like to get that free, just go to my website, you'll see a pop-up. You just have to provide your email address and your name and the ebook will be emailed over to your inbox. Ah, amazing. And it looks absolutely fantastic. So I highly recommend it. And of course, all the, all the links in the show notes as well for people so they can, they can come and find you. Thank you so much for for joining me today and for our incredible discussion. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. And thank you everybody for listening and for joining us. If you've loved our conversation, then please do let us know. Come and uh, tag us on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram. Let us know what resonated for you. And we're looking forward to seeing you on our next episode. Sending you all lots and lots of love. Thank you. Namaste. Thanks for listening to the Infinite Prosperity podcast. And if you like what you've heard and want to know more, please go to louisahavers.com. We just appreciate you so much. So thank you for listening and hanging out with us. If there's anything that we can do for you, you can email us at louisa at louisahavers.com. 
let my team know if you have any ideas for shows that you'd love to hear or topics you want me to talk about. Really looking forward